All right, what's up guys? So super exciting feature for you here today. I would say um, we're at probably one of the top demonstration sites here in the state of Florida and we're probably with one of the top plant guys in the state of Florida. And when I say top, I mean legit top. Like Josh is a OG in this pushing different crops in central Florida, plants that grow well in Florida kind of game. So he's got a lot to share, a lot to show you guys. And I'll just put it out there real quick. Last time I was here about two weeks ago, I did a bunch of stories here on my Instagram and if you guys you know aren't happy with the amount of uploads we do we're only getting one video up a week maybe sometimes two videos a week and you want to stay more up to date with my you know weekly routine what's Pete doing today I post every day on my Instagram links always down in the description down below live stories pictures videos all day long all day strong so if you guys want to stay up on me more often check out the Instagram page I'll shut up you guys ready for Josh hold tight Hey, welcome, my name's Josh, and we're out here at the Hart Village. Um, Hart stands for Hunger Education Resources Training. And this is a training facility for students who are wanting to go serve in developing countries, um, doing service work of all different kinds. Um, our students may end up doing things like Peace Corps, missions work, um, in the fields of agriculture, nutrition. So uh, this is a demonstration farm that's part of the training program. Uh, that demonstrates all sorts of techniques and plants that can be um, applicable in the developing world and also just getting the students acclimated to the kind of conditions they might find if they're working in the developing world. Uh, we're on 40 acres and something like two and a half of that's got plants on it and then there's more with pasture. When did it start? Uh, 1980. 1980 here? Yeah, but quite a bit of the farm development's gone on in the last 10 years. Cool. Yeah. All right, show us what's growing on here, Josh. This is cool. Well, there's a little bit of everything. The entryway here is just trying to demonstrate that uh, we do a lot of tours for kids groups and of course our students and things like that. So we want to demonstrate that there's um, so many plant resources um, out there in the world that can improve people's lives. So right here is just a big hodgepodge of things and also kind of demonstrating the food forest idea or agroforestry of integrating uh, different plants together. So we've got Suriname cherries and hot peppers and um, Peruvian apple cactus, lots of papaya, avocado, banana. There's a nice bunch of bananas coming on there. That's like a cardamom type deal. Cat like guavas, sugar cane, just kind of a little bit of everything here. Nice. Mm -hmm. now, you guys eat out of this garden every day, right? Yes. Yeah. So we're trying to provide as much of the food as possible for the kitchen. So we do three meals a day in our kitchen, uh, serving 10, 20 people. And we're trying to grow as much of that as we can here. You got a percentage maybe you're up to 60% or we're, something? We're a hundred percent um, sustainable here in produce right now and animal products for the most part. Um, and I'm, Right now I'm getting into legumes and I'm into tuber crops too, so we're trying to step up you know, filling out the calories and proteins and stuff, yeah. I like it. Yeah, but in terms of fruit and vegetables, definitely we are giving stuff away. We're totally set in there with that. You can't keep up with the abundance with 20 people. That's pretty incredible. For the most part, there's times a year where, you know, it can get a little sparse, but right now, yeah, I mean, we're giving stuff away. Still pumping. Um, All right. mm -hmm. Let's check it out. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the students are out here every day. Um, part of their training is hands-on um, garden work every day. So John there is a student, and Annie is an intern, and they're picking strawberries right now. Uh, they do two and a half hours of lab time every day, and they're harvesting, weeding, planting, picking whatever management needs done out here. A lot of it's here in these vegetable gardens. So right now we've got cucumbers coming in, a little bit of broccoli, eggplant, strawberries, you know, a little bit of everything. Nice. 
Now these are some new beds for you guys. You want to talk about kind of your success and what you've done here with these beds at all, Josh? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we used to grow kind of in standard raised beds that were just right in the ground. And we did fine. We did everything right, I would say, in terms of lots of organic matter and cover cropping and all those things. But still, uh, the conditions are so harsh here, we just had a hard time. There were certain crops we couldn't even grow, like eggplants. Um, so we decided to do something dramatic. And I, I learned about what they did in Cuba. So after the Soviet Union collapsed, Cuba lost all their uh, money and they had industrialized agriculture. They lost all their fossil fuel and everything. Um, so they switched to these kind of intensive raised beds. So I read some literature about that and watched some videos and I really want to go see it in person. But um, essentially these are these raised up beds in a frame and then there's lots of um, rich things added to this to improve on the native soil. So there's a, some of this, it's kind of deceptive because this red is on top, but there's not a whole lot of that. Um, so the red is local clay, and then there's compost, and then it's probably 60 to 70% of our native sand. Uh, the clay is on top because I wanted a nice top layer. This really helps with germinating seeds and uh, transplants getting established well. This stuff comes out of the ground 10 or 15 minutes from here, actually, this red clay. Nice. Yeah, so some of the, the clay does come out of a big pit, and um, I'm not super excited about that, but I was also not excited about trucking in food from different continents. So it's kind of a trade-off, I think. Um, I'm happy with it now. And this will be a transition sweet potato bed yeah, for the summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So part of, part of this is also, um, we're trying to, I'm trying to just master this system where we're using every inch every day of the year. So this was an onion crop, which I could show you that we just, so we yanked the onions and they're up drying. And then that day or the next day we come in with a sweet potato and then I'm also working on an academic calendar so my hope is that when the next batch of students shows up in August we harvest the sweet potato and then something else goes in so it's just kind of passing the baton off to thing after thing after thing based on the season and what we need and I'm, I, we don't really have workers here in the summer so hopefully also the sweet potatoes just keeping these beds weed free and choking out all the weeds um, at the same time growing a crop that we're gonna eat all, uh, all through the fall I would be real happy to get a couple thousand pounds of sweet potato out of these beds this summer. Nice. Oh, we'll see what, what we get. What do you got on the other side over here? Carrots. Um, this is something really special. It's kind of collapsing here, but it's a 50 year old uh, heirloom bunching onion that somebody from our town gave me. His grandparents grew it. And they've been saving the bulbs and replanting for 50 years here in our town. So I, I planted this as just a grow out to get the bulbs up and I'll probably be sharing and selling those this year. And taro. So taro is another one I'm trying in, um, just like the sweet potato. It doesn't work quite as well because they come out in October. But Now that's a little bit of a special variety for you, right? Yeah, that's a Puerto Rican variety I got from a guy in our town that was selling them at the farmer's market. You and had pretty good production on one plant or something, right? Yeah, I've gotten 10 pounds off of a plant, and I've grown a lot of different taros, and this is the only one that I've really had great results with. So uh, this is the first year I've been able to scale up and actually do a lot of it. So we've got another bed of it over there. Cool. Yeah. And it doesn't actually need any sort of flooding. People think taro, you want to plant it around a river or whatever, but this particular type grows great, just like you would grow a cabbage or something. Nice. Mm -hmm. I have, it's not as great right in the ground, yeah. uh, unless it's really enriched. Yeah, so it's kind of, a, it's an intentional community here. So you hear that bell ring and we have three meals a day together and um, share food and people rotate who's cooking breakfast and lunch and dinner. Nice. Yeah. So this side are students' gardens. So a lot of them, this is their first vegetable garden they've ever had. And they come the first week, they plant everything and then they're, they weed, fertilize, harvest, do whatever. And they kind of get a grade on that for their ag class. and. Um, just learning the basics of growing vegetables in here. So each each one, each full bed is a student. Some of them do better than others. Um, not too bad for students. Yeah, they're doing yeah, a good really job. Pretty good this, yeah. this season. Some stuff starting to cut out because of the heat. The peas are really kind of done. Getting towards the end of their life. The lettuce is bolting. Yeah. Yeah, these are all. 
this is our little seedling house uh, and they're all gone because we're done for they're the out. season okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's the other taro bed yeah I'm trying to trying to intercrop the taro with a vegetable crop to see if I can just squeeze two things in at once because it's kind of a lot to sacrifice the grow the growing space for just the taro at the in the spring so I think it's gonna work they're kind of filling out nice. whole beans are about to start coming tomatoes out. and peppers seem to be rocking pretty well too huh yeah uh, they're okay the, these two beds have some deficient nutritional deficiencies and I've found as I build the beds they're deficient off the bat and then they kind of slowly as the compost breaks down a little their nutrition pick yeah the older beds are the most fertile there's you can see there's a different green color over here than there is over here because these are newer I think yeah cool yeah, we just did sweet, put in more sweet potato here. This is a variety trial. We put in 12 or 13 different varieties in here. Um, I didn't have the heart to cut out the eggplants. So this is a starfruit tunnel. I don't, know, I don't know if you've seen this, Pete. Um, built this frame, and we had a whole bunch of other things in here, and last year it didn't work. Uh, in the cold, we lost the mangoes and things. But the starfruits did pretty good even outside. So um, this is ready if we need to on a freeze night. Uh, that, that can go over, and we planted, planted these real close, and they're gonna be managed with pruning and bending and kept small. And we're gonna get a whole lot of starfruit out of here. Looks like y'all are pumping out some bananas here too, huh? Yeah, mild winter means bananas here. So these exciting. Are, these are dwarf namwas. And there's a calabaza pumpkin plant. It does fill out underneath here soon. Nice winter story. Yeah. Chayote. You're a pretty big fan of chayote, aren't you? Yeah, we'll have to go see the chayote. You geek on them a little bit? All right. Yeah, All we'll right. have to go check those out. This is the uh, orchard, so it's kind of a mixed orchard planting, uh, kind of uh, agroforestry, permaculture inspired. So there's avocados, uh, we had a lot of citrus in here that got cut out a few years ago, switching over to other things. Avocados. With uh, avocados, that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, this is a uh, guanacaste tree. Guanacaste, really? And uh, these establish really well in the shade of these. Um, and I also will grow yams up this thing. So uh, this is a, um, a yam trellis. Grow a lot of yams. Um, in between the rows of trees, we're doing like nine month type crops. So right here is yams and an accidental pumpkin that's doing really good. And then over there it's cassava. And I also rotate pigeon pea and roselle in between all the rows. Now, for people that don't know, we're talking like a true yam. Like, how big are these things yeah. when you harvest them, Josh? Like, well, <laughs> the biggest one I've harvested on this farm was 139 pounds, but um, I'm aiming more for 10 to 15 pound tubers okay. because they come out of the ground and they're this big, and that's a lot more Woo. reasonable to deal with when they're when they get that big. They're swallowing trees 30 feet away, and you gotta do a big excavation. And you prefer the white varieties for flavor, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm only planting a couple of those purples anymore. I like the white ones. Okay. Yeah. Nice. We just had a mashed white yam for lunch yesterday. Mashed yam, like mashed potato with pigeon pea on the side. Awesome. Yeah, so there's a different fruits. Papayas are our number one fruit here for sure. We're harvesting 100, 150 pounds a week right now, papaya. I just picked a few days ago and they're already need to pick again. Now Josh, what's your preference on those? Do you like them ripe or, or green? Um, we eat them green, but I, I mean ripes. Ripes yeah. is good. Okay. Yeah. And I would normally pick these before this stage, but there's so many right now that if a rat eats one or something, we don't care. So I let them ripen on the tree. Oh. Uh, so this is native American persimmon, uh, mulberry, pomegranate. Got lots of uh, persimmon, uh, Asian persimmons setting right now. Fig. Nice. This is a grafted fig. Whoa, grafted fig. You experimenting over here? 
Yeah, so it's on a different ficus, species, ficus glamorata, or actually now I think there's some confusion what we've got, but it's ficus that tolerates nematodes as a rootstock. And uh, so right in the ground we can grow these figs without any special... People do all sorts of different things to, you know, pile organic matter, grow them in pots. I think it makes sense to just skip all that and graft them. So the persimmons are setting lots of, uh, this is a fuyu, lots of fruit coming on. This is a uh, che fruit. So it's uh, Cudrania. It's uh, related to mulberries and jackfruits and all those. And it's a Chinese fruit. It gets about that big. It's red. Tastes like a, um, like a little watermelon raspberry thing. Wow. Yep. Josh, what's going on with this big wall we got behind us here? Tell us what you're doing. Yeah, so this is a multi-purpose windbreak on the whole side of the farm. And so it's, one, it's blocking the wind, but also we're trying to demonstrate for people working internationally to grow, grow resources right on the farm. So fence posts, um, firewood, construction material, and also lopping these limbs, feeding them to the goats. Uh, there's, and also, so see it's flowering up there really heavy right now. So it's a nectar resource wow. for the bees. What species is this for people? Carimbia Torelliana. Okay. It's not really a eucalyptus anymore. They changed the name. <laughs> These are three years old from little tiny things, and they're already beautiful hardwood, huh? Uh, yeah, I don't know about the quality of the wood, um, but I'm suspecting they're decent. It's like green, gorgeous. Yeah, they're really pretty. Yeah, and I just basically watered them in and bucket watered them once a week for a couple weeks and then they're on their own, never touch them again. Mulberries are coming in. See, this one's called Sixth Street and it's about a month later than everything else. So this is the one that's producing now. The other ones are mostly done. So that's the nice thing about the Sixth Street, huh? Wow. Yeah. And it'll miss a late frost. Mulberries? It's kind of a enormous, one. It wants to grow enormous, which I don't like, but that's okay. Shout out to uh, Florida fruit geek, Craig Hepworth. This is his tree. He named this American persimmon, selected it out of the wild and named it Turkey Lake. And actually that's his tree too, the Sixth Street Mulberry. So I put them together to honor uh, uh -huh. Craig. Yeah. Okay, so one of my obsessions is uh, chayote. And I started collecting and planting these some years ago and slowly learned how to grow them. And I've grown maybe 10 different types of these. All right now there's just two in here. So this is kind of a more typical grocery store chayote. And this is a uh, Honduran variety, which they call uh, pataste there. Um, so we're picking these once a week or so right now. And you can see they're all in here too. They just really, really produce fruit. And these are kind of like eating a zucchini or something, a little different, but. They're awesome. They're one of my favorite things to grow, for sure. I just love how they hang down. It's really cool looking. Yeah. I have some other colored ones I'm working with, too. Um, if you go to Central America, they all shapes and colors and spines and different flavors, even. Delicious summertime vegetable. How many varieties are you up to? There's two, uh, a lot. I don't know. We've lost count over here, Josh. <laughs> well, I, some of them don't do, like, one I'm about to pull out over there because okay. it's not fruiting and it should be fruiting. Um, I just got a new one, a Guatemalan one, that's the uh, the legendary, it's Huisquil de Papa, which is a potato chayote. And it's dense and starchy like a potato. Wow. I haven't tasted it yet, but that I'm excited. Good. Yeah. Nobody's really collecting these chayote genetics, so I'm trying to trying to make them available. Hey. Oh, you got tomatoes? What is this? Ooh, okay, okay. Cool, man. Thanks for the treat. No problem. Just put this in yesterday. Oh, cool. For uh, more grapes. More grapes? Okay. Yeah, I like, I don't know if you've ever covered these, but these, I like these. You can do this for like 35 bucks or something. And We did one at a project at Jubilee. Oh. And it got so heavy with the passion fruit, it collapsed. Like it got, it got pretty loaded down. Huh. So the I guess depending on the that. vine, yeah, grapes should keep it up. 
So this is our urban garden demonstration over here. So we're demonstrating techniques for growing food in a, in a dense city setting. Um, so there's things growing in tires and it's for the most part in containers. The whole idea is less low amount of soil and optimum yield in a small space and just being creative with what you have. So this side is simulating a rooftop garden. So even if you live up on a rooftop in a major city, you can still grow some vegetables. That's what we're trying to show. So right here you see it's just that much soil. And there's- That's the pure growing. concrete? Yep. Wow, mm -hmm. incredible. A lot of cities in the developing world at least have these concrete roofs. Like if you go to Port-au-Prince, Haiti, it's all these concrete roofs. And a lot of them, the rebar is still sticking out the top. And it's like that because they're planning on putting another story on there. So you know it's sturdy enough to hold stuff because they're going <laughs> to build more on top of it. Cool. So uh, this, this area is, we rotate around with different crops. Um, the, the perimeter is filled with leafy green perennials. So we've got Ketuk, which is uh, kind of like, it's a ultra tropical deal. It really likes hot, humid weather. So it's still kind of coming back from winter, but you eat the leaves, they're kind of like a sweet pea flavor. And you can just strip these off and uh, put them right into a stir fry, really good. And then that's chaya, which is the uh, Mayan tree spinach. That's a cooked green, really, really good one. And then the moringa, which most people may be familiar with. Um, Haitian basket vine, that's another leafy green. And then the Nopales cactus, uh, Opuntia cactus back there, you can cook the pads as a vegetable. So it's surrounded by these leaves, and then inside we grow different crops. So this is cassava. Some people may call it yucca. Grow lots of different types of this every season. Um, and this is a major calorie food for us through a lot of the year. It's, we plant here March 1st and you harvest December, January. This variety is called Togo. I named it that because it comes from Togo, West Africa. You guys mostly eat this fresh or have you flowered it or anything like that yet? Uh, yeah, we will make uh, flowers and okay. different things. My wife makes a really good uh, pizza, flatbread pizza, yep. all sorts of things. And we've had some Brazilians that have taught us the different ways to. What are you guys trellising on the bamboo here? Are these yams or? True yams. Okay. Yeah. I kind of starting to try to separate them on different areas of the farm because they're hard to keep track of. Yeah. They can get loose on you. Yeah. So there's one off to the races here. Off to the races. Like, and you're not joking either. Like, within a month, it's going to be up on wrapped around the top of this, huh? Yeah, they'll fill this out and pour over. I like the, these teepees are a pretty good way to trellis them. I do different things depending yeah. on, but I, I like these. Uh, so this this is demonstrating mountainside agriculture. So um, a lot of the poorest people in the world are, get pushed off of the lowlands and shoved up to the mountainous areas because it's sloped. It's not suitable for plantations, for big businesses to plant or um, build hotels and things like that. Whatever. So it's really the poorest of the poor you find up in the mountains. So we wanted to show some agricultural things here. So we built this. Uh, with the tractor just bringing in buckets of soil built this up to show some different techniques There's our terraces and then this is kind of like a living terrace where you uh, have the vetiver grass or lucena on the contour So the water runs and it hits Kind of the water runs perpendicular to the hedge. So it soaks the water soaks in and then um, Limits erosion on the mountainside. We've got cassava up. There is a, a chira which is a uh, Kind of a rare root crop. Wow. It's an Andes mountain root crop. The one that kind of looks like the canna lily or whatever? It's a type of canna. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah. That's a variety called Baldwin's that last year really produced. So, For those that don't know, what do you grow the Lucena for? Well, we grow that for one for, well right here you see it again. That one is for kind of an overstory. And then in this case, um, you can cut and lay it for mulch, but also we feed it to our goats and you can make compost with it. You can really do a lot with it. Nice. And um, in Mexico, they eat the immature seeds. Sometimes we'll buy a little bit, um, especially for the, the pregnant moms or whatever, and it also will depend on the time of year. 
Okay, nice. I'm not sure. I don't work with them much, but right now I'm not sure what they're doing. It looks like they're on forage. Uh, Want to see the where we grow their food right here? Okay. This is all different species for feeding to the goats. There's Mexican sunflower, mulberry, guazuma, lucena, glaricidia, a whole bunch of different trees. Or not glaricidia, sorry, that was a mix up. Um, now I can't remember the name of the tree. <laughs> so this is pretty much your fodder system then? Yep, and this too, this is uh, napier grass and Mexican sunflower. Wow. These guys get out here every day and cut all this and carry it on there. Which one does the animal seem to prefer the most? Like the candy of the fodder crop? Mulberry. Mulberry? The edible leaf one? Any of them. Really? Okay. They feast on it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mulberry. They'll dig through the pile. And they also really like China berry. Really? Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, so this is our little vineyard. These are mostly muscadines and a handful of bunch grapes. So I got real discouraged about the bunch grapes. Um because last year they came out of dormancy early and they got nailed and then they languished all year and I thought they were kind of a bust. But this year, I mean, they're really loaded. They're coming on, wow. These are some really custom poles too. Uh, are these homemade? Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're handmade in a uh, just a little frame. You cast the cement with some rebar in it. Solid yeah, concrete. this is either El Primo or uh, Boink to Boy. I can't can't remember off the top of my head right now. Nice. Yeah, the only thing is, is if if they if there's a late frost, you lose them. Ooh. So the muscadines don't do that. The muscadines are awesome. Last year, some of these vines had so much fruit they were trying to they were starting to pull off of the trellis. <laughs> uh, they're just coming out now. They're putting on new growth, and those are the little flowers or or just pollinated fruit. I'm not sure, but. So these will be clusters that hang yeah. down right here. So what's your main source of nutrition on the farm? You guys aren't using any fertilizer, right? Yeah, so we have several systems. We collect all the manure. So we have a water buffalo, rabbits, goats, chickens, ducks. We get manure from all of them. We also have a pig pen system where they compost all sorts of landscape, um, like leaves and bedding and things like that. Um, that's the main thing. We also make compost. So nothing coming in bagged fertilizer wise? No. Okay. This year we brought in a lot of compost to build those beds. But okay. other than that, no. Cool. No.